We've got uh, Professor Paul Fennell from Imperial College uh, going to talk to us about industrial CCS. And... Yeah. Okay, so I think without more ado, Paul, um, tell us uh, a bit about industrial CCS, please. Uh, start there. That's me. Um, what I'm going to uh, say today, a lot of it's coming from... Um, uh, the Zero Carbon Action Plan for America, um, and uh, you'll see some of the slides there, um, mainly because we spent a long, long time um, workshopping everything and making sure that everything was um, uh, robust in terms of evidence and that sort of stuff. So um, uh, that's a good document to have a look at if you're interested in um, some of these things. It's a very long document, so um, you know, skim read it uh, if you do look at it. So industrial CCS as a whole, <coughs> if you look here, you've got a plot of the partial pressure of CO2. So uh, how much CO2 you've got in a given um, volume um, for a variety of different um, processes. And the key thing with industrial CCS is unlike, say, a coal-fired power station or a natural gas-fired power station, um, where they're fairly similar one to the next to the next to the next, um, industrial uh, processes are very different in terms of the concentration of CO2 that they output. Um, the minor contaminants which might be um, within the process and <coughs> consequently uh, because of those two things the appropriate type of carbon capture and storage which um, would be applied on them. Uh, there's also another secondary issue which is how much heat there is available for um, regenerating a solvent or for um, driving a CCS process or indeed with some of the more advanced processes how much heat you could use from a CCS process which um, exports heat back to a um, system. So there are a number of trade-offs that are around. If you look up here, you can see um, that there's some sources of CO2 that have nice, high purity, high partial pressure, um, and are relatively easy to capture um, the CO2 from. And at this stage, I should uh, just quickly mention that the amount of energy that you have to put in to capture um, CO2 um, goes as, strictly speaking, the log of the partial pressure. So as you go up in partial pressure, you have to put in less energy to um, capture your CO2. So this is why all of these sorts of things should be captured first. And this is why coming down here, you start getting more and more difficult, although gas turbines, etc., uh, natural gas boilers, that sort of thing. Still, you know, CCS is, is still um, eminently doable, even down at the lower concentrations, the lower partial pressures. Uh, and then you would have down here somewhere uh, CO2 capture from the air, which obviously uh, um, a lot of people are talking about, but God, that sounds like uh, the ex-president of the uh, USA. A lot of people are talking about air capture. Um, but you can see right down here, it would be a very low partial pressure of CO2. So everything up here you do first, everything around here you do first, and then you really start thinking about capturing CO2 from the air. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of industry can be electrified, um, and um, that's in general a good thing. Um, a point that's quite important is that um, we're not making huge gains anymore in terms of the efficiency of, say, uh, 
uh, cement kilns or in terms of uh, uh, blast furnaces. They're basically as big as they can feasibly be, which reduces the heat losses, etc., from them. And what that means is that um, progress in terms of decarbonisation of them uh, won't be coming from improving the efficiency of the processes very much. Obviously, there's this, you can always make something a bit more efficient, but um, not by a huge amount. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, heat too much, but it is quite an important point. It's, um, it's important to know about what temperatures your heat is in, uh, in a process, uh, because um, that allows you to rationally design the best carbon capture and storage system for a particular um, industrial process. Uh, process emissions are important. I'll be discussing those as well in a second. Uh, again, cement produces CO2 as an intrinsic part of the uh, process. So the first thing that you do when you um, make cement is you um, essentially drive off CO2 from uh, calcium carbonate to form calcium oxide. That CO2 is about 60% of the overall CO2 from um, cement production, and you can't get away from it, right? Um, so that's why CCS is pretty much key for cement um, processes. You cannot get away from that CO2, and cement is about 7% of CO2 um, globally. Also, we're going to be needing to produce a lot of hydrogen um, in the future, and there's going to have to be um, CCS on um, steam methane reforming. Uh, hydrogen from steam methane reforming being with CCS being significantly cheaper than um, green hydrogen, and there are limits on how cheap you can make electrolyzers. And you also need uh, some form of uh, carbon feedstock for chemicals. And you have to make sure that any new things that we produce um, aren't producing a lot of greenhouse gases. So the Zero Carbon Action Plan stated at the beginning that it would focus on industrial activities such as iron and steel, cement, uh, where there's large quantities of process emissions which require very high temperatures because sometimes those are difficult to get to um, without combustion based um, systems. And um, you can see here the splits for the US. Um, you know, there's, there's a similar split for the UK, but there's a lot of different industries around you know, making up the majority of emissions, but um, sizable chunks come from um, iron and steel, cement, chemicals, refining, um, that sort of stuff. Um, one key point is that um, for most large scale industrial processes, major refurbishments, and I'm speaking here on cement, only happen once every blue moon so here it, it's been looked at for the cement industry once every 25 years and you really would like to cycle in um, making major alterations to the process at the same time as um, you make <clears throat> major refurbishments so um, that's something that needs to be uh, thought of the other point with the cement industry is that um, cement is extremely difficult to substitute for. Um, at the moment, um, the vast majority of cement that we produce, um, which is about uh, ninety percent and probably even more, is ordinary Portland cement. Um, that's the cement that you go and buy from a um, uh, from the garden centre or whatever. Um, and that is um, what I'm going to talk about here. There are other types of cement, but they haven't been proven for 
structural applications and structural applications are um, the vast majority of applications. So if you're going to make, if you're going to decarbonize cement, you have to decarbonize ordinary Portland cement. And the reason that you have to decarbonize ordinary Portland cement is because that's in all the building codes. That's what the buyers trust. That's what um, is understood by you know people as um, the uh, the cement that uh, you know, people will specify. Um, any other cement, uh, a good friend of mine once said to me um, in the cement industry, uh, build a bridge, have it stand up for 20 years, and then um, after that, we might be interested in a novel type of cement. So there's other applications for some of these things, paving, non-structural, roof tiles, that sort of stuff, but they're not the majority of cement. <coughs> so here is um, just a brief slide uh, showing in a stylized manner, the um, cement production process. Um, you feed in your limestone up here. It goes down through a set of cyclones uh, and into a kiln. Uh, and then within the, it's not quite this um, extreme angle. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, limestone would just fall straight out if it was at that uh, angle, um, where reactions happen to turn uh, the limestone. Uh, it's reacted with sand and clay and a few other bits and pieces um, to make a mixture of calcium silicates. And those are what are actually the, the glue in cement that binds the cement together. Uh, the countercurrent um, reaction, with, sorry, not countercurrent reaction, countercurrent flow of the hot gases from the kiln. So the, the air comes in here, goes up, and countercurrently uh, contacts with the limestone as it's coming in. And that helps to do the initial calcination of the um, CO2, the, the initial reaction of limestone with CO2, which sort of. Um, uh, pushes the uh, CO2 off and so your exhaust gas comes out here and you would be adding CCS um, on here. There's various sources of um, heat within the system and heat as I said before is very important and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail later. Down here um, are all of the different ways that we could think of that you could um, uh, decarbonize uh, cement. And um, uh, that's that. 60% of the emissions uh, intrinsic can't be avoided. So if we look here, this is the US version, but uh, you know it's the same around the world. Um, you, this is the uh, emissions intensity. This is how much CO2 you produce per tonne of product. And you can see that for cement, you're basically producing a tonne of uh, CO2 uh, per tonne. Sorry, this would be for uh, cement clinker, not for actual cement, but I'll discuss that in a second what the actual difference between cement and cement clinker is and also for steel so you can see that you know emissions have been the emissions intensity the the energy effectively the energy use that you're using the co2 that you're producing because of that energy use is slowly coming down but uh, uh, nowhere is it um rapidly dropping anymore because the cement kilns are, are as efficient as possible um yeah that's basically it so large amounts of co2 intrinsically produced um ccs directly removing that co2 is going to be needed for cement production uh people are talking about electrification and um, uh, 
electrifying cement kilns, uh, using hydrogen to run cement kilns, uh, even biomass for cement kilns, but none of those address the process emissions. And uh, that's basically what I said there. So, what we talked about cement for a while there. Oh, sorry, I said that I was going to talk about the difference between cement and cement clinker. Um, so, what comes out of the um, what comes out of the kiln is cement clinker. And that's the sort of thing that you use to, um, that's the glue that binds um, cement together. And you can add other things to that cement clinker, which can partially replace it. So those are called supplementary cementitious materials uh, and other materials as well, which don't change the uh, cement properties in terms of make it's still a good cement it'll still um, stick things together it's it's uh, it does its primary purpose but um, are sort of much cheaper um, don't need to be going through these high temperature processes etc and one of the main ones is uh, ground granulated blast furnace slag um, and you can replace the clinker directly with gran gr granulated blast furnace slag. And what that means is that overall the intensity, the CO2 intensity of the cement process goes down because you're essentially grinding in a waste product. Now you get into issues with life cycle analysis and all this sort of stuff and who makes the, is, is the ground granulated blast furnace slag a product of um, the steel industry or is it a waste from the steel industry and you have to assign emissions to um, different uh, processes you know uh, carefully you have to think about who's being decarbonized if you add in uh, clinker uh, so if you add in a supplementary cementitious material to your clinker um, so as I say clinker is basically the glue then you can add in other things which act as glue you grind it then you export it to um, a as as cement right so having said that um, and going and thinking back to the original plot um, that I showed on the sort of second slide this one you can see that um, as I've stated, there's there's different horses for different courses. There's different CCS technologies that are appropriate for different um, industries. And that's reflected in this plot, which comes from a uh, paper uh, written by one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Duncan Leeson who uh, now works for Bayes. Um, and what it means is that different technologies have different costs for different um, processes and some processes that are more suited for CCS than others. And some will therefore be more expensive than others. So if you look down here, you've got the high purity sources. So this is cost. And for a number of different industries, and the bubbles here are the number of, of studies that we could find that actually gave a um, a cost. Um, so it's a, the results of a systematic literature review. So you've got your high purity sources here, and they are actually pretty cheap to do CCS on. And then um, iron and steel, most of the processes. Um, lumped together around $70 a tonne avoided. I think this was 2016 prices, so it might've gone up a little bit. And then for cement here, you have a uh, pretty expensive amine scrubbing and then um, other costs here. This one is the cost for calcium looping and a new technology, uh, the direct separation reactor has been developed um, for uh, cement production and that would be somewhere around here as well it's, it's a cheap way of um, 
uh, doing CCS. Right, so um, different compositions of your um, off gases lead to different um, CCS costs. However, that's not the only story. Um, if you look here, um, this is just a, a, a stylized idea of a um, post-combustion capture with chemical um, absorption. So your standard amine scrubbing system. And the important thing here is that you have this reboiler. So this is taking steam, which you've diverted from your uh, power cycle and which you condense here. Um, and for all sorts of fun thermodynamic reasons, you don't have to pay that much of an energy penalty for um, condensation of that steam. Um, I won't go it is complex why. However, um, on a cement plant, um, and depending on the industrial process on a number of others, you don't have um, the um, you don't have the availability of low grade heat that you would need to um, drive this um, without paying a significant price. So you either have to put in a combined heat and power system, or you have to do essentially CCS on only about half of your flue gas, uh, because there's a around half of the CO2 that you actually need um, in your system to um, uh, drive it. Right, Let's see, 10.32, right. So that's that. Um, there are, however, other technologies that fit in very nicely. I'm not going to go through the details of um, these technologies because I think it's a little bit too um, uh, detailed for an introductory lecture. Um, but just to know that there are technologies that fit in it much better with each industrial process. So calcium looping um, fits in uh, very nicely, essentially because um, it's using uh, calcium oxide to capture the CO2 in a cyclical process. So it goes calcium oxide, captures the CO2, becomes calcium carbonate, CO2 comes out here. So essentially it's, it's, it's a process that's just capturing CO2. But because it's using calcium oxide for capturing the CO2, obviously you can see that there's a um, synergy that goes on with um, cement production where calcium oxide is the main feed. And further, further, yada, yada, yada. Um, been demonstrated at 1.7 megawatts thermal as part of the cowling project, which I was a member of. Um, that was about 10 years ago. Um, direct separation, this is the uh, current uh, new kid on the block. So essentially here you have a big tube, a big hot tube, and you um, basically pass your limestone in here. It falls down the big hot tube, which you're externally heating, and the CO2 comes out. But you haven't put in any, uh, you haven't allowed that CO2 or the uh, limestone essentially to contact with the air. So um, the CO2 is pure and comes straight out here. You produce your limestone down here. Um, because you're not actually, because there's a, an element of intrinsic separation with this one, um, you end up. Uh, having a significantly cheaper uh, process. Essentially, you're driving the process with heat, which you would have to produce anyway in order to, which you would have to put in anyway in order to actually drive the chemical reaction of calcium carbonate becoming calcium oxide and CO2. So um, there's no strictly, there's strictly no reason why you have to pay an energy penalty um, for this particular method of um, calcination. Uh, you do have to start, you do have to think about what you're going to do with the heat here. Uh, 
uh, with the CO2 from providing the heat here, um, because uh, only you're only getting rid of the process emissions here. You're not getting rid of any fuel emissions. Uh, demonstrated successfully in Lilac 1 and uh, uh, is currently being demonstrated with Lilac 2, um, which is going to be about 20% of the uh, throughput from a um, uh, cement plant. Uh, it's being demonstrated uh, and uh, I will uh, state quite categorically that the reason that we weren't invited into Lilac 2 was because of Brexit. Um, the industrial partners were worried about having any British partners, but uh, let's carry on. Okay, so I did discuss supplementary cementitious materials. Um, you can replace some of the cement clinker with alternative materials. Um, as I've said, uh, ground granulated blast furnace slag is the um, major one. Uh, coal ash works. There are some naturally occurring rocks, but uh, you know they're, they're basically um, not that uh, common. And biomass and other ashes, but the biomass ashes probably need a bit more work to um, make sure that they're okay. Um, you can replace, so China, was replacing up to 40% of their clinker with supplementary cementitious material, so these additional things. Um, that was um, leading to issues with the cement quality, so um, uh, they have now rowed back, and a f uh, globally the replacement rate is, is coming up to about 70, sorry, is coming up to about 30%, so... Um, uh, you don't um, want to replace too much of your um, cement clinker with supplementary cementitious materials because it may uh, make your um, cement worse. But you want to replace as much as possible um, because you effectively, um, you know, some of these materials are wastes um, and... Uh, uh, it saves you CO2 to use them in cement rather than just uh, putting them into the ground. Um, and they're already into the building codes, which is very, very important. Uh, important point that some of the materials used may become scarcer moving to a decarbonized future. So here is the results from a recent study where we looked at how much um, decarbonization you could do by replacing um, material, the cement clinker with other supplementary cementitious materials by improving the efficiency of your um, kiln and by applying CCS. So what you can see here is that um, if you don't do um, anything, if you just use fossil fuels uh, and apply CCS, you can get down, you know, probably you'd cut off around here. Uh, you can get down to uh, reasonably low, you know, 10% of the emissions um, without uh, anything else. Um, the important point about this slide is that even if you um, use hydrogen or electricity to fire your calciner, you still have lots of emissions going on um, and you have to have CCS anyway, so uh, what's the point? The two down here are very interesting. This is firing the kiln with uh, municipal solid waste and this is firing a kiln with biomass. And um, when you're firing with municipal solid waste, which will have a reasonably high proportion of um, uh, biogenic material in it, you start being able to pull your emissions down with high proportions of CCS into negative, te uh, negative um, territory. 
And the important thing here is that MSW is cheap and easily available. And people will be competing heavily for biomass, clean, nice biomass, but they won't be competing as heavily for MSW and for all sorts of reasons to do with the um, large amounts of uh, uh, fine material in and around a cement kiln. Um, you can use a higher proportion of municipal solid waste than um, can be used in many other um, processes. So um, MSW plus CCS is, a, is a, a good technology for cement. Uh, lots of people talk about um, recarbonation of cement wastes. Um, so there are waste materials that are produced on the cement um, plant, but overall they're very small in volume. And the main carbonatable waste which um, is produced, um, we've done calculations. We, we're just putting a uh, present. Sorry, we're just putting a um, report together for the IEA. And we looked at this, we looked at it carefully, and um, the kiln bypass dust can take up about 0.7% of the CO2 emitted from a plant. Um, and there are other dusts, but everything should be recycled within a cement plant. The idea that you might um, use some of the um, uh, wastes that are in in a cement plant and not put them back into the kiln and recarbonate them doesn't make sense. So the main point here is that, that there are some wastes in cement production. You can carbonate them. You can put CO2 back onto them. But but in the vast majority of cases, it's it's just a small amount of CO2. You can carbonate lots of other wastes. So carbonate systems um, has processes that can um, carbonate um, a number of wastes outside of just cement wastes. Um, but it's a small flow of CO2 and um, it's good technology, but it's mainly a technology for um, waste management. Carbonation of certain waste materials locks the um, uh, locks the nasties away inside them and stops them coming out. Right, iron and steel. Uh, again, similarly to um, uh, cement, there's a significant process emission. Um, this comes from uh, essentially the use of coal or uh, metallurgical coal to produce carbon monoxide um, and hydrogen, um, which you then react with your iron ore and the carbon monoxide rips the um, oxygen off the uh, iron ore and you end up with iron and CO2. Uh, you can use hydrogen to do that sort of ripping off process as well um, however you do um, need a lot of hydrogen to actually um, uh, do that so again there's this intrinsic process emissions here I won't go through exactly what happens in the blast furnace suffice to say that you stick your iron ore and your coal your metallurgical coke in at the top um, it goes down through the blast furnace um, becomes uh, the, the iron ore becomes successively iron and then comes out at the end and your exhaust gases come out of the top um, the key thing that um, you need to think about in the future is which pathway we would go for steel production. Um, would you go a system where you have um, the standard process, the current process, um, where you're using a blast furnace, etc., and then um, uh, 
and producing iron and then um, transforming that into steel um, using uh, a carbon-based um, reductant, so a carbon-based material that will pull the um, oxygen off the uh, iron oxide, or would you go for a hydrogen-based process which um, directly reduces the iron, so it takes the Fe2O3 and reacts it with hydrogen, pulling the um, uh, oxygen off that way. This sounds alluring, and it is in general. There's demonstrations going on. But you have to worry about how much hydrogen you actually need um, to pull off directly reduced iron. Um, when we did a calculation for a steelworks um, around the same size as uh, uh, the uh, British Steelworks, um, we found that you would need the output, if you were producing green hydrogen, we found that you'd need the output of a medium-sized nuclear reactor in order to produce enough hydrogen to um, uh, replace this. So it's a big, big um, uh, thing to think about. I won't go through um, recycling. Biochar also, obviously, in the olden days, um, you know, steel production used to be done with uh, charcoal, and um, it uh, can be done, um, but the, the the blast furnace. Now, the sizes of the blast furnace mean that um, uh, coke from charcoal or charcoal instead of coke um, may not be quite strong enough to um, provide the structure that's required in a blast furnace. And again, you need vast, vast amounts of um, uh, biomass. I mean, the reason that the UK doesn't have uh, forests anymore is because we cut lots of them down um in the industrial revolution and chuck them into um making iron and steel um so there's demonstrations ongoing and there's more that came out last week that i haven't put in um, in there future of iron and steel there's all sorts of wacky and fun ways to produce um iron and steel that are at low technology readiness levels and hopefully they will um, uh, come about in the future. Here's one that I came up with. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but this one can produce hydrogen and iron um, from natural gas. So uh, that's a uh, that's a that's a winner, um, but still sadly um, at the uh, level of uh, TRL three um, chemicals. Lots of chemicals. You may need a carbon feedstock for um, chemicals. You're certainly going to need hydrogen.
stage, I will say thank you very much. And uh, any questions, any discussion, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs>